Did, did you just say hi, Sean? <laughs> Welcome to everybody on Facebook. Glad you're with us. If you're watching, um, I'd encourage you to get your Bible and follow along with us. We're going to start a new series tonight. Um, I've entitled it Seated in Heavenly Places, and this is the authority of the believer is what it's called. Um, but before I get into that, I have to announce the Women's Glorious Christmas event. And, uh, ooh. <laughs> so my wife has sold... I don't know, I don't know what it is, 59 tickets or something, so there's, I think, 20, 25 left, 24 left, okay. So if you want to get one, you can see Marianne right here, and she will um, help you out with that. So adults are $15, and then uh, 7th to 12th graders, uh, ladies, of course, young ladies, are uh, $10 for tickets, so... Um, if you want to know more about it, see Mary Ann or talk to any of the other ladies around and they'll tell you it's a good time. So you'll want to be there. All right, we're going to pray here and then we're going to get right into this. And uh, I ask that you have an open heart to the word. Um, we are going to avoid just opinion at all costs here and uh, get right into the scriptures and, and see what God has for us as believers. Amen? Amen? All right, Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we know that um, your word is truth. Lord, that the entrance of your word brings light. Father, we know that uh, the enemy is the, the prince of this world, but you've already defeated him in Christ. And we are in you, Lord. We are no longer in the kingdom of darkness, but we've been translated out into the kingdom of the son of your love. Not only do we have heaven as a destination, Father, but heaven came into us when we were born again. We are so grateful for what we've received in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Father, I just ask and I open myself up to you. I yield the grace and the, anoint or the gifting that you've placed within me uh, to you. Father, speak through me. Give us ears that hear and eyes that see. We believe you for utterance and for boldness and speaking the truth in love. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's go over to Luke chapter 10. I want to begin there. Um, like I said, we're beginning a new series um, for, for our foundation Wednesday night Bible studies, and the title is Seated in Heavenly Places. What we are studying is the authority that has been given to us in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, oftentimes what people think in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is they simply think that I get to go to heaven now that I've received Jesus since he came. All my sins are paid for in him, and I'm now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when I die someday, who knows when, I get to go to heaven. And there is a truth there that is right but then there's also the other side of it, which is this. You have now been invested with the kingdom of heaven in you now. And this is, this is often where um, you'll have separation in denominations and doctrines and all these different things. But what we need to do is go back to the scripture and see what the scripture says. How many know that our favorite denomination is not the authority? It's the scripture that's the authority. Amen? And so we need to go back to the scripture, and we need to look and see what it says. And, and don't just listen tonight with ears of, uh, that are blocked. Listen with open ears and allow the scripture to enlighten and transform your mind. Okay, so we're going to avoid opinion as much as possible, but doctrine is from the scriptures is very valid, and if you allow it, it will do, as the scripture says, it'll open up and enlighten you into something maybe you didn't see before. Amen? How many have had this, uh, had this happen in your life? You were bumping along through life, and then you heard the message of Jesus Christ and how he paid the price for you, and you found out that you could be born again, and you yielded to that word, and you received Jesus, and your life was changed from that moment on. Well, if it could happen with that truth, it can happen with many truths that are in the Scripture. Amen? Okay. So... What we're looking at and I, and I, is the believer's authority and what was, what was what one of the points of what took place in his death, burial, and resurrection. I sense in my heart that it is necessary truth for us to understand and walk in more and more in the years ahead of us. This truth has application in every area of our lives. 
Since this truth of our authority in Christ is unveiled more fully in the book of Ephesians than any other epistle, I encourage you to read the first three chapters over and over again for several days. Read the first three chapters of Ephesians over and over and over again and allow the Holy Spirit to open that up to you and reveal to you what the Holy Spirit was saying through the apostle. Luke chapter 10 verse number 17 says this. It says, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That, when I read that scripture, I laugh every time. I smile inside, you know what I mean? What did Jesus see Satan do? Fall like, not just fall, it's not like he just tripped, you know? He's like, oh, there goes the devil, he's gone, you know? He tripped over, no, he was, I see it like this, the father picked him up and threw him at light speed. <laughs> Okay, in other words, you know, sometimes people get this picture in their mind, and, and I want to erase this and, and reshape the thought in your mind according to the scripture. They have this idea that God and Satan somehow are equal opposites, and they got into an arm wrestling match over who was going to control heaven. It wasn't even close to that way. Satan said, we're taking over. God said, you're falling at light speed. <laughs> Satan is so weak. Listen to me. Satan is so weak that one angel will tie him up when it's all said and done. That's what the scripture says. See, around here, we don't worship the devil. You know, in some churches, they don't mean to, but they kind of are. Because they're in awe of what he can do. I'm not in awe of the devil. I'm in war <laughs> from a winning standpoint in fighting the fight of faith against him and standing my ground and enforcing the kingdom of God. But why? Why is that? Why do I have that authority? Why is that authority given? Is It's because Jesus died and brought us back to the place of authority that Adam sold us out of. Amen? Okay, we're gonna, I'm making statements, and, and they're going to stick as we go, but you'll see it as we go. So he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He said, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, somebody say nothing, shall by any means hurt you. And then he says this, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that, your, that the spirits are subject to you. What are the spirits? What are they subject to? That the spirits are subject to who? You, right? Now watch this. Now, now it is in Jesus' name. So they use the name of Jesus to make the spirits obey, correct? That's what they did, Correct. And so is the name of Jesus less effective today? Has it lost power? Do you think we need the name of Jesus just as much as they did in that day? How many think that the word of God spans all time? It's not bound by a day or a year or a... Do you understand what I'm saying by that? In other words, when Jesus spoke the words that he did and the Holy Spirit spoke the words that he did through the apostles, the different ones that wrote the scriptures that we know as the Bible today, when he spoke that word through them, that word was timeless and it spoke to every generation. It's still manifesting. We'll see this as we go. But in other words, we see here that the spirits are subject to us in the name of Jesus. Now, we'll get into more why they are as far as the body of Christ today. But he says this, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's exciting that the demons are uh, subject to us in the name of Jesus, but that's not really where our source of joy comes from. Our source, source of joy comes from what? That we are children of God. That God is our Father. Amen. Come on. He's a father to the fatherless. People say, well, I didn't grow up with a father. You've got the heavenly father. And if you'll allow faith to extend out of your heart to him in that area of your life, if you've had hurt in that area, he'll, he'll mend it, he'll fix it. 
And it'll be like, you'll grow to the point you'll go, well, there's no father like my father. And, and you may see others that have a natural father, but you'll be so satisfied on the inside because you got the father. Amen? So that's good there too. In the uh, New Living Translation, it says this, when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall, like, fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. So what do snakes and scorpions represent here? Demons and devils, the works of the enemy. And you can walk among them and do what? You can walk among them and be afraid and cry out to me and, come on, you're to crush them. Now, when we're born again, we receive a new spirit. How many realize that? You have not been given a spirit of, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? Amen. So you can walk among them and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Somebody say, they obey me. (laughs) Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. We're going to have to get more bold with this, but we'll get it as we teach. All right. First, I want to do this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you a couple of prayers that you need to pray repeatedly in your life. As we establish here, and then we'll go into what authority is tonight. And then next week, we'll hit more. Praise God. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, verse uh, number 15. I want to start there. And there are two different prayers here in Ephesians, and they're just, they're absolutely wonderful prayers. Now, I want to read this beforehand. Although these prayers are for a certain group of people in a specific time period, there is no difference between saints then and saints now. I'm going to say this again. There is no difference between saints then and saints now. How many know they had to be born again as well? And that same right is ours today, okay? So... There's no difference between saints then and saints now. We are just as much saints today as they were when Paul wrote this epistle. There is no such thing as the early church and the late church. (laughs) I love this. I love this. There is no such thing as the early church and the late church. There is no such thing as the early church or the late church. There is only the universal church. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know, and and because we think naturally, we can get in trouble in these areas. Because we think, well, I went to church. No, you came to the building. You is the church. This is just a building where we can facilitate the teaching and ministry of the gospel for the renewal and the effective equipping of the saints so that they can go out and be the church. People think, well, I didn't, there's, there wasn't, you know, uh, 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 they think, well, my church is located here. No, that's the building where we, the church, come together as the body of Christ. And I'll just say this, even though you know, how many know people that, were, that, are, that uh, are born again and they've passed on from this life and they're now in heaven? Do you know they're still the church? <laughs> Do you know you're still connected? Well, I don't got time to go into that, but anyway, you are. All right? So there is no such thing as the early church and the late church. We are all part of the universal church, the body of Christ. So this prayer applies to us today. Okay? I do not believe that God died when the apostles died. Now, people that use that argument, I have a, there's several things that stand out in the scripture to me. Um, with a cessationist mentality that stand out to the scriptures to me that just do, wouldn't, don't add up. First of all, if, if miracle signs and wonders were for the original 12 or the apostles as we know them, then why did the 72 come back and have authority over the enemy? Or if that were the case, what about, what about uh, Stephen who is just a table server? who had miracles, signs, and wonders. See, it doesn't even matter 
what office you hold, quote unquote, or don't hold in the body of Christ, you have authority over the enemy because you're part of the body. You have authority over him. And the enemy must obey you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 16, Paul says this, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the eyes of your understanding, and the, a better word there is your heart, your center, your understanding, excuse me, understanding, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, they're in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, now watch this, but also in that which is to what? And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the which is his, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Who's the head? Who's the body? The church. And Jesus put all things under his Feet. Can I ask you a question? Are your feet in your head? Neither are Jesus's. You are the feet. Well, you could be somewhere in between too, I guess, because he's the head. Some people are like, I'd prefer to be the neck. Fine, you could be the neck. You could be the hand. You could be the. Do you see what I'm saying? But if Jesus put all things under his feet, and then he says, Jesus is the head. And then he says, the church is the, then where are the feet? So where is the enemy in comparison to you? He's under your feet. He's under your feet. And this includes everything the enemy has and uses. Everything. Jesus did not do an incomplete work in his death, burial, and resurrection. He, he was so confident, he said, it is finished. He went down into hell, and he went, I'm taking everything, I'm destroying all of your stuff. And then he rose up and led what? Captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Ooh, I felt a little breakthrough right there. <laughs> we must be getting past the observing stage. All right. Let's go back up to verse uh, 16. I want to hit some things here. Verse 16 and 17. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Notice that Paul makes mention of them in his prayers. It did, now, there is a time to spend a long time in prayer, but I never saw that before till the other day. Makes mention. What does that mean? Lord, I just mentioned to you Faith Family Church. Father, I just thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you'd continue to open their eyes and that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would flow in them and in their lives. He made mention of them. Now, I'm in the long prayer times. I mean, we do it. We pray. We pray in the Spirit for you. We pray over the church uh, weekly and consistently, multiple times. We do it corporately at least once, but we do it consistently. Why? Because we want the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. We want to see the Lord work in such a way in your life that what you are currently in bondage with, He sets you free from. Now, I'm not talking about we have to talk God into it. I'm saying that we are believing that heaven is coming down. Heaven is manifesting itself, not only on top of you, but from within you out. In other words, you have your mind so transformed to the reality of who lives within you that you just go ahead and step out in faith on your own, and the enemy is stopped in his tracks, and you're set free. Why? Because you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you. It shall make you free. Amen? 
And so what, what Paul's doing here in verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, watch this, in the knowledge of him. Now watch this. God wants our spirits to be full of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Listen now. Wisdom and revelation are a product of the knowledge of God's word and the Holy Spirit. We are never told in the scriptures to ask God for knowledge, but we are told to ask him for wisdom and revelation. Isaiah chapter 33, verse number 6 says this, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of your salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. This puts wisdom and knowledge together. Many people think knowledge and wisdom are two words that, that mean the same thing. But as we saw before, they are not. Knowledge is an input and wisdom is an output. Knowledge is an input. Wisdom is a what? Output. It's an application of knowledge. Come on, which one is blessed? The doer of the word, not the hearer only. See, in the church world, and it can happen this way, but knowledge will puff you up. They like to have knowledge, have knowledge, have knowledge, have knowledge, have knowledge. Have, I got all this knowledge. I know about this and know about this and know about this. I used to tell, when I was a youth pastor, I used to tell the youth all this time, you know, sometimes I could tell they were like, oh, he's preaching on this again. And I'd just say to them, look, I don't know you got it when you can repeat it back to me. I know you got it when you're doing it. And that's exactly how the Lord is. The Lord is this way with me. And he was this way with the children of Israel. When are you going to go in? Oh, Lord, it's not fair. Around the mountain again, boys. Around the mountain again. And again. You know, some Christians are just so frustrated because they just won't do what they know they're supposed to do. Oh, did I not warn you? This is Wednesday night. <laughs> Sorry. We don't patty cake on Wednesday night. <laughs> This is the crew that came to grow and live in freedom. Amen? Okay? So uh, when it comes to the, the things of God, God will allow a, a born-again believer to remain a baby their entire lives and go on to heaven. He'll allow it. Why? Because our faith needs to be engaged in what he's doing. So I'm not only gaining knowledge, but I'm applying that knowledge. So I'm not only gaining wisdom from the scripture on how to treat my wife, but I'm going and opening the door for her on the car and letting her in. Until it becomes so a part of me that if she doesn't let me do it, it irritates me. <laughs> Come on. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not just, I, I'm becoming so aware of the scriptures on finances that I govern my finances according to what the word says. I'm a doer. I have understanding. I see the light. I'll just put it to you like this. The most frustrating times in my life spiritually is when I knew what to do, but in my rebellion, I refused to do it. Absolutely the most. And I'll go to fasting and praying. How many have done that before? And the Lord's like, back there. And I'm like, Lord, but you promised this up there. The prophecy said, he said, Sean, I was the one that originated the prophecy. It doesn't happen until you go back there and do that. Oh, so you know what you do, right? This is why Brother Hagin used to say to us all the time. I'd rather be behind God than ahead of him because I can always speed up. <laughs> it's a lot harder to go back. Amen? So I, I would do that. I would, and he'd say, no, you got to go back here. So I'd, okay, you go back here. And then he'd say, okay, now you're going to be patient, and you're going to talk this way, and you're going to do this, and you're going to, you know, these are the things you can tell the Lord works with me on, okay? I was raised in a very sarcastic home. We loved each other. We just had great sarcasm. So <laughs> we, we had a, we're very vocal. Um, but anyway, and, and so I had to go back and learn these things and learn these things. Oh, no, you're not going to do this, Sean, until you get this right. 
I got to get this right. Yeah. And I said, Lord, but that just, it's, it, I don't, I want to go do that. That seems like more fun. He says, Sean, if I don't have you do this first, you'll get out there doing that what I want you to, and the enemy will take you out because you are not strong enough because you haven't fixed this area first. And what I mean by fix, I mean that he's already fixed it in his grace. I'm just cooperating with the empowerment thereof and bringing forth the manifestation by an act of my will and faith. But I am not the strength in it, okay? So i got to make that clear because I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Taking in knowledge is a discipline for us. Study to show yourself approved, a workman that what? Needeth not be, okay? Know your stuff. Once we do our part, God will bring illumination, revelation, and wisdom when we ask him. In other words, uh, uh, go down to verse 18. This will bring it about even more clear for you, I believe. The eyes of your understanding or heart being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the, in the saints. True illumination or revelation takes place in the mind, not the spirit. Now listen to me here. Revelation occurs when the wisdom of God, which is resident in our spirit, explodes across our conscious mind. Illumination occurs when the mind and the spirit come into unity. We knew it all the time in our spirit and it finally dawned on our minds. Usually when this occurs, we say, I see it. How many of you have ever said that? How many of you are not even looking at anything? You just inside, you go, I see it, I see it. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. You ever had that happen? That's called an aha moment. <laughs> it's called illumination. In other words, all of the, res- the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead Paul said, lives in me now. So what does the epistles deal with in accordance with understanding coming forth? The transformation or the renewal of the... So in my spirit, I've received what we would call, Peter called, incorruptible seed. Undying non-destroyable, cannot be annihilated. Death can't touch it. Death has already been conquered by it. That seed lives in me right now. And out of understanding that, out of the Holy Spirit bringing understanding of that to my mind, then I can operate from that place of illumination in wisdom and application, and then there is a manifestation of who God is in my life. So I go from, you could keep it, you could make it as simple as this. That person used to really irritate me till I understood the love of God. Let me break it down even further. This will be fun. Okay, prepare yourself. Because <laughs> this is a fun subject. There is no person that is a greater irritant than the ability of the love of God to overcome. Come on, come on. You know, we do, Heidi and I were talking about this today, and this is some of the stuff that the Lord deals with me about. What if Jesus decided whether he was going to obey based on whether the people around him obeyed or not? But see, Christians do this. They say, well, I would go, but you know, those people did this to me. I would serve the Lord. I've heard, I'm not just telling you something that I heard somebody, you know, said that somebody said. I've heard this over and over again. Well, I would serve the Lord, but you know, his, his church was too mean. So you know the Lord's your Savior, and you know he's the one that paid the price for you. But you're choosing not to obey him because of what somebody else did. Come on, let's pull the excuses out. Amen? I'm going to do what the Lord told me to do, whether it hair lips the devil and makes everybody mad. Come on. If, if, guys, look, we cannot be so sensitive 
and operate in strong authority. It will not happen because there will be people. I watched a video one time of a guy who was going around praying for people on the street, and there was a guy that he saw that had a, a, like some sort of knee brace or something on, and he, he's like, that guy, I'm going to go pray for that guy, and he goes up to pray for him. The guy cussed him out up one side and down the other, was an evolutionist, didn't believe in God, all these things. Well, so that person didn't receive. There's somebody else with a knee brace. <laughs> right? Okay? So what am, I, what am I saying? I'm saying, look, if we're going to grow and develop and become what God wants us to be, there has to be that place in us where, okay, that hurt my feelings, but it's not going to my inner life. It's not going to stop me. Yeah, but they mistreated you. It's unfair. Everybody has been mistreated. Now, some people have been mistreated in different ways than others, but in all reality, I will just tell you this. The scripture says that every temptation that we have experienced is common to man. I'm not making light of the fact that it was, I'm not saying what they did to the person or to us is okay. I'm saying that if we want to move forward and live in freedom, we have to go, you know what? That really hurt. Thank you, Lord, that you're a healer. I forgive them. I bless them. I release them. I will hold nothing against them. I have authority over the enemy and I'm not going to live in his darkness and his world. I'm going to walk in the love of God. I'm going to walk in freedom. I'm going to move forward with the plan of God with my life because you said, Lord, that the path of the just is like the rising of the sun. It shines ever brighter into the perfect day. So I'm going to go ahead and buy extra sunglasses because I know it's going to be real bright. Because I'm going to bring some people with me, so I've got to give them some too, you know? Why? It ain't over till my heart stops. And I am not going out of here without my boots on. Do you know what I mean by that? That's a, that's a cowboy saying, right? You die with your boots on. What does that mean? I still got oxygen. My heart's still beating. I'm still drawing breath. I heard uh, Keith Moore say this years ago. He said, as long as the world turns, my heart beats and I draw breath, I will use my faith and I will do my best to bring glory to God. Yeah, but what if it all, all fell apart and the government fell apart and we became a communist nation? We go to jail for Jesus. Right? People say, well, I don't want it to be like that. Well, pray and vote. <laughs> Amen? Pray and vote. So in other words, we need understanding to come to us. You have been deposited with Christ. Christ, you did not receive baby Jesus. <laughs> come on. Now, we have to develop, okay? But God's ability in us is not getting he doesn't have to uh, give you more of him. He just needs to get you to discover how much he's already given you. So the development side of it where scripture talks about growing out of immaturities is just you realizing who you are in him more and more and more and more. Amen? You don't need to give a healthy baby more body parts. You just need to feed him. Exercise them, train them, and if they're healthy like they should be, what will happen? They'll grow. Like Mike and Jody know, they have four boys. You don't even want to know how much milk they go through. I saw an article today or the other day that the biggest milk company in America shut down. They went bankrupt. Sorry. <laughs> Might want to buy a dairy cow. <laughs> but you, in other words, what's taking place? They're growing because they're healthy. Well, as Christians, if we're healthy, we're growing. Come on. Come on. We're growing into that authority. It is necessary that you understand your individual authority and don't just depend on everybody else to do your praying for you. Well, if you say, well we believe in prayer and we believe that everybody should pray for everybody. I'm okay with the prayer of agreement. I'm, of course, it's biblical. But believers that grow and are strong and grow and develop, they know, how to co they know how to communicate and fellowship with God. Their relationship with him is at such a level that they aren't looking for somebody to pray for them. They're looking to pray for somebody. Come on. I heard T.D. Jake say years ago, you know, the difference between the patient and the doctor is which side of the gown is open. 
All right, we can move on here. <laughs> so just turn your gown around and go, I'm the doctor. What do you need? <laughs> Amen? Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, and what does, what does the Lord want us to see? Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So, did God work in Christ for Christ's sake? He worked in Christ for my sake. Jesus did not have sins to pay for. Did Jesus have a sin problem in himself? You say, how do you know that? Because he was, he was born of the seed of God, not man. I don't have time to go to, into this. Just go back to the website and listen to the blood covenant message. And the, what, the understanding. But I'm going to say this. Blood is, is, comes through the sperm, not the egg. Jesus didn't have a natural, so there's no sin in his in his blood. So when he was crucified, that's why the scripture says, and you need to look at it this way, that's why the scripture says, Jesus' blood cried out better things than that of Abel. <laughs> oh, oh, if you could see this, oh my goodness, it's exploding in me right now. Okay, so if you, Abel's blood said revenge, Jesus' blood, every time, come on, from the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's sweating, Come on, you're getting revelation of authority here. It hit that dirt. Do you know it's still in the dirt? Going, mercy, it's paid for. Righteousness. In other words, the devil, can't, he could dig in that. He could find somebody to dig that dirt up, but he can't get it out of there. It's, all, it's too late. It's already in the ground. It's already there. And then you've got all these Christians running around going, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. And we overcome the enemy by the blood of the and the word of our. So in other words, we're in covenant. I am blood drenched. There is blood in front of God right now going, Sean is righteous. Sean is righteous. Sean is righteous. Do you see that? Yeah. You should put your own name in there. Amen? Amen. He is righteous. Why? Because he chose to have a substitute. See, I don't come to the Lord on my own works. I work from a place of righteousness, not to get one. <laughs> I'm seated in heavenly places. Okay, i got to move on, but that's so good. Uh, I'm just a little excited about it. So which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills. How much? All in all. We must have this spirit of wisdom and revelation of Christ and his word if we are to grow. It is not going to be imparted to us through our intellect either. The Holy Spirit must unveil it to us. This is not an intellectual... Let me prove this to you. Some of the most intellectual, the, what people consider to be the greatest minds do not believe in God. That's because it is hidden from them because their heart's not right. Now, if they would adjust inside and repent and get their heart right, then the scriptures would open up and they would be able to understand with their mind what their heart already knows. This is why, like, uh, in ministering to people and ministering... Uh, to people who don't know the Lord, it's why it's so important because what's happening is in us using our authority to help them, the kingdom opens up to them. They all of a sudden come in, they encounter something that doesn't make logical sense, but yet it is a tangible reality. 
So as believers, when we understand our authority, we minister to other people. And it can be through words or it can be through actions. It can be through all of the avenues that we have capability in in this natural world. It can be through money. It could be through uh, uh, food. It could be through, come on, you understand what I'm saying. It could be through clothing. It could be through any number of avenues that the Lord has given us in instruction in demonstrating the kingdom of heaven. It could come from all different avenues, but when you participate with the Lord and you yield to him and then move out in faith and demonstrate a love that is not common to humanity, all of a sudden what takes place, if the person is receptive and open, there'll be an impact, an imprint of the kingdom of God on that person's life. And even if you never see them again, that encounter will speak to them by the Holy Spirit for years and years and years and years and years and years. Amen? It will continue to. Why? Because you're functioning in your authority. People say, well, I didn't. It's not like I uh, operated in the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit or something like that. Yeah, but you're a, you can get to that place, but as a house of the kingdom of God, you can release God in a smile. Come on. I know sometimes people think, well, I don't know about that. That's because you don't know who you are. Amen? Okay? So this is designed to open up and open up. What has kept you captive in fear and worry will begin to break off as you know the Lord. There is no bondage in Jesus. He has no fear to give you. He has no uh, oppression, depression, bondage, yokes, chains. He, has, he doesn't even have that to give to you. It's coming from the enemy. And when you understand your authority, you'll take authority over the enemy and start driving him out. Amen? Okay? So, and that's, the, that's part of that authority. Okay, Ephesians 3, verse 14 through 21 is another good prayer. You should pray that. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> okay? We have, go to Ephesians 1, verse 3. Because I want to get to, um, and, and on those prayers... I'll just tell you this. Brother Hagin said this. He said he prayed those prayers over his life uh, more than a thousand times, and it was one of the greatest turning points in his life uh, that he had ever experienced. He did that over a six month period, and he just would, he had his Bible open to them, and he would pray one after the other, and instead of, uh, in, he would change the construction of it so that it was personalized. And you can do that. Pray those prayers over your life. If you, have, if you know somebody who, doesn't, who knows the Lord, but it's in bondage in an area or something like that, you can put their name in the prayer and pray that prayer over them. Use your authority. Use your faith. And as you do, they'll be set free. But you can learn. It will open things up to you that you never realized. He had been, when he had done that, he had been saved for about 15 years. And he said he grew more in those six months spiritually than he had in the first 16 years or 15 years of being born again. After he prayed those prayers. Why? What began to take place? Of all the knowledge in the scripture that people have, been, have had put in them for years. How many have been in church for year after year after year after year after year after year after year? Read the Bible through year after year after year after year after year after year. And it feels like nothing's really changed. Maybe you need to pray those prayers. And what will take place is God will begin to open that up to you. And you go, oh, wait a minute. I'm not the victim. I'm the victor. Greater is he that is, hmm, than he that is in the world. Amen? Instead of walking around, some of you will have to do facial exercises because you'll, you'll be smiling more, so it'll feel awkward. <laughs> okay? It takes more muscle to frown than it does to smile. And people say, what are you smiling about? Your life isn't any better. Yeah, but I found out how it was changed and just keep hanging out. God's on the move. Amen? Amen? Just keep hanging out. It'll change. 
It'll change. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In the New American Standard, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. Every single one. And this includes authority. This includes authority. You have been enriched in Christ. Okay, you've been enriched in Christ. These blessings are a reality in the spirit, whether you realize it or not. You can have benefits that you don't know about in the spirit, just like you do in the natural. There are people who have all kinds of rewards programs with benefits they don't know about. I'm talking about in the natural. How many have rewards programs? How many ever had this? You had a credit card, you don't really do anything with it, and then you call them up one day and they're like, yeah, you got like 70,000 points in rewards. Would you like to use them? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to use them. See, people are like that in the spirit. They call heaven, Lord. I, he's like, you got like a billion rewards up here. <laughs> Would you like to use some? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like that. All right, anyway. Years ago, there was a story about a man who was found dead in a small rundown room he rented for $3 a week. He had been a familiar sight on the street of Chicago for about 20 years, always dressed in rags and eating out of the garbage cans. When he wasn't seen for two or three days, concerned neighbors went to look for him and found him dead in bed. An autopsy revealed that he had died of malnutrition, yet a money belt found around his waist contained more than $23,000. That man had lived in abject poverty, Selling newspapers for a living, yet he, yet he had money. He could have lived in the finest hotel in town instead of that little rundown room. He could have eaten the best food instead of garbage, but he didn't, but he didn't uh, use what belonged to him. We need to know what belongs to us. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In Hosea, God says, my people, not sinners, not the world, my people are destroyed For a lack of knowledge. People actually perish who wouldn't have to. They wouldn't have to. So what is authority? Luke chapter 10 verse number 19. Behold I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Authority means delegated influence. It means jurisdiction. Mastery. It means governmental rule. You know, some translations of that verse say, I give you power, and that's not a good translation. It should be authority. Yeah, it says Uzia. Yep. And it should be a translated authority. It should not be translated power. Power is dunamis. Okay? So there's two different things there. He gives us authority. Now, we'll get to this, but the power, authority is also defined as the power of judicial decision. The power of judicial decision. Vine states, the power of rule or government, the power of one whose will and commands must be obeyed by others. Okay? The power of one whose will and commands must be obeyed by others. Simply, authority is delegated power. Authority is delegated power, okay? Delegated power. In other words, Jesus gave authority to the disciples over all the power of the enemy. Serpents and scorpions are representative of the devil and demons. The value of our authority rests on the power that is behind that authority. Listen now. God himself is the power behind our authority. The devil and his forces are obliged to recognize our authority in Christ. The believer who thoroughly understands that the power of God is backing him can exercise his authority and face the enemy fearlessly. 
The value of your authority is only as good as what backs you. What, who backs you. So you don't need to speak the name of Jesus in panic. Come on. You can go, oh no, devil. Mm -mm. Christ in me. The hope of glory. You have authority over him. Okay? So this is where the spirit of wisdom and revelation needs to come in. Because I can give you the scriptures. But the Lord has to open that up. And as he does, come on, he's doing it. Okay, we need to do this. We need to do this. Because I... People are so ingrained in their experiences. And the, enemy, and the enemy has built strongholds. Come on, it's real. Right? So say it with me. Say, I have authority in the name of Jesus. The Lord, when I speak his name, does not leave me hanging. The power is working. He always backs up his name with force. Every time. Come on, you, some of you can feel that. You go, oh, there's a little bit more room. Yeah, you just back him up. See, the Bible doesn't say in more than one place that you're just submit to God and resist the devil and he might flee from you. No. Come on, let's believe it. Well, my experience have been, yeah, but have you exercised and understood what you know and exercised it? Have you understood what the Lord said about you and exercised it? Because that's the key. Okay? Maybe, and you will find this, if you allow the Lord to take you back over your life, he'll say, look, he, now he's not going to condemn you, but he will correct you. Amen. You know, sometimes people think, God's in heaven, he'll never speak any word that would hurt my feelings. You're wrong. That's not the Holy Ghost I know. And every time he has come to me and corrected me, I went, oh. Now, he's not berating me, but he is correcting me. And what comes with it is this sense of there's, a, there's an open gate right over there if you want to run out. Amen? There is nothing in your past. There is nothing that has happened to you that the healer has not already provided healing for. Nothing. It does not exist. The devil does not have a weapon that he can come up with or form that doesn't already have an answer in the resurrection for freedom. Come on. Including everything you see going on in the earth right now that you never thought you would see. Come on. Right? It's exactly that way. Defining authority and power. A person stands at an intersection. Crowds of people are passing by and groups of vehicles are on their way to their destinations. Suddenly, a man in a police uniform raises his hand. Instantly, the traffic stops. He waves his hand to the waiting crowd of people to cross the street and they walk across in a steady flow unharmed. What is the explanation? The police officer does not have the power to stop those vehicles. He could not overpower the vehicle in motion and stop it. The police officer has something far better than the power. He has the authority of the local government where he serves. The people in the vehicles are, and on the sidewalk recognize that authority and obey it. Authority then is delegated power. Its value depends on the force behind the user. This story illustrates the question of authority, and, of authority when two opposing powers are in conflict. So the believer who is fully conscious of divine power, of the divine power behind them and of their authority thereby can face the enemy without fear or hesitation. The enemy who confronts the believer uh, have specific names of power. The enemies that confront the believer have specific names of power and authority. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities against powers. But behind the authority possessed by the believer, there is a power infinitely greater than that which backs his enemies and which they are compelled to recognize. 
In other words, you are not running at the enemy by yourself. Come on, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the and in the power of his might. So people say, well, I feel weak. <laughs> That's okay. You don't got to be worried about what you feel because you are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let me finish with this and then we'll be done. Once in England, Smith Wigglesworth was standing on a street corner waiting for a bus. A woman came out of an apartment house and a little dog ran out behind her. She said, honey, you're going to have to go back. The dog didn't pay any attention to her. He just wagged his tail and rubbed up against her affectionately. She said, now, dear, you can't go. The little dog wagged his tail and rubbed up against her again. About that time the bus arrived, the woman stomped her foot and yelled, get! <laughs> the dog tucked his tail between his legs and took off. Wigglesworth said he hollered out loud without even thinking, that's the way you've got to do the devil. That's the way you've got to do the devil. You've got to stomp your foot and say, get. Okay? You've got to, I'm going I'm to read, how many, like one more illustration here, just to, I'm going to read this to you out of Brother Higgins' book. This is a, a great testimony that he had. In 1942, while pastoring in East Texas, I had a test in my body. I didn't tell anybody about it except the Lord. I prayed and believed he would heal me. Then I stood my ground. In the nighttime, I would be awakened with alarming heart symptoms, and I would get up and pray. I battled that thing for six weeks. One night, I had, a gr I had great difficulty in getting to sleep. Finally, after praying, I drifted off, and I had a dream. I'm satisfied that God has spoken to me only four times in my life through dreams. But a dream like this one was no coincidence. It was from the Lord. When I woke up, I knew immediately what it meant. In the dream, it seemed that another minister and I were walking on some kind of parade ground or ball field. There were stands on either side of us, and we were walking along talking. The man jumped and exclaimed, Look! I turned and saw two ferocious roaring lions. The man started running. I started running with him. Then I stopped and told him we were too far away from the stands to reach safety. We'd never escape those lions. I stopped dead still, turned around, and went back to meet the lions. They came toward me with their fangs uh, bared roaring. I was trembling. I told them, I resist you in the name of Jesus. Notice he was trembling, but he's still saying it. I resist you in the name of... Don't put so much stock in what you feel. <laughs> Amen. Right? You know, people think, well, I'm trembling. I must be afraid. No, 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 no. Let your mouth lead, not your feelings. Oh, I'm going to say it again. Let your mouth lead. Your body will get in line. Amen? I'm tr I was trembling. I told them. I told these lions, I resist you in the name of Jesus. In, the, in Jesus' name, you can't hurt me. I just stood there. They ran right up to me like a couple of kittens, sniffed around my ankles, and finally frolicked off, paying no attention to me. Then I woke up. I knew exactly what God was saying to me. The scripture in 1 Peter 5 came to me. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast, in the faith. Come on, says, it says resist how? Steadfast in the faith. faith. The physical battle that I had been fighting was won right then. Instantly the symptoms disappeared and I was all right. I had stood my ground. I wouldn't give in. I had won. Amen? When you've done all you can to stand. Amen. Come on, you might as well, like Mark Hankin says, you might as well just swing over hell on a corn stalk and spit in the devil's eye. Amen? You know, people, see, people hear that, and they go, what? what the, I, Christians are supposed to talk like that? You know, I don't ever see where Jesus ran from the devil. I do see where de devils ran up to him and in fear. Amen? So, if we're his children... 
If we're God's children, if Jesus is our older brother, come on, everybody, in, everybody knows somebody who's had an older brother or who had one, they wanted to be just like their older brother. How many want to be just like your older brother, Jesus? Okay, now listen to me. You've already been made like him. You just have to function out of it. Amen? So don't roll over. Don't give in. Fight the fight of faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Lord, we thank you for this word. Lord, I thank you that even now, by your word and by the anointing on your word, that bondages in people's minds have been demolished today. Lord, that truth has come in where there has been darkness, where there has been depression, where there has been uh, uh, this fear. Lord, joy and light and peace has come in. Father, we purpose to be doers of your word and not hearers only. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for meeting us, teaching us, and we will go forth and be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen.